Kyle Busch is done. Well, in one series anyway. It appears that Kyle Busch's Xfinity Series career has come to an end. Easily, the most successful driver in the series will not compete in 2022. However, he will compete in the Truck Series. We will talk about this a big move, plus some more motorsports news. Let's get into it. So NASCAR's clash has been hailed and heralded as a enormous success. And today uh, we learned the TV ratings for the clash and Fox's broadcast of the clash at the LA Coliseum scored NASCAR a ratings improvement. 4.283 million viewers tuned in for what is claimed to be a 168% increase over 2021's clash at Daytona on the road course. Though it's very important to remember, and a lot of people who are kind of uh, in a circle right now talking about this, um, is that the clash this year um, in the Los Angeles Coliseum was on the network Fox, and last year's clash was mired back on Fox Sports 1. So, you know, 168% increase um, from last year certainly looks good and is good, don't get me wrong, um, but it's not necessarily a fair comparison to put it up against any of the FS1 clashes. Perhaps the most surprising is that the heat races, um, the races that uh, none of the ticket buying people either knew to or didn't want to show up to, um, actually produced uh, two and a half million viewers, um, which Fox Sports' own Bob Pockris claims is the highest for a qualifying broadcast that NASCAR has had since 2016. And it begs the question, because one of the great things about The Clash this year, particularly the qualifying format, um, which was, of course, heat races, um, was that absolutely no one was locked in. You, everybody had to race their way in. Um, now, with the charter system the way it is and the way it is written at the moment, um, I wouldn't necessarily think that qualifying is going to be a free-for-all at a points-paying race anytime soon. Um, but it certainly seems like the market spoke on this one. And for uh, you know someone who always defends bump day at the Indy 500, um, and the, the counter-argument always is, well, what, what if Chase Elliott misses the race? What will happen then? Um, well, you should have tuned into qualifying, is what I say. And it seems like a lot of people tuned into qualifying. Um, certainly, this is a case study in trying, uh, not only trying something new um, with the LA Clash at the Coliseum, um, but you have to acknowledge that this was not just because NASCAR did a race in Los Angeles. It's because of a heavy promotional campaign by both NASCAR and Fox. The interesting question that I have is what it took to achieve this rating. And I'm talking dinero, I'm talking moolah, I'm talking money. How much did NASCAR and Fox spend to do this? Was this actually a profitable race? You look at how much airtime Fox used um, on its own networks, and then you look at how much it would have cost to put on a race at the Coliseum. Um, what Did this TV rating pay the bills? Probably not, at least in the first year. Um, but that being said, I, I think that this is a great start, um, and we're going to have to see how it progresses throughout the years. Uh, if year two, you know, if it's the heat race crowd in year two, I don't expect that, but, you know, if the heat race crowd shows up for the entire race next year, um, certainly it won't be um, continuing. But I think at least at this point, uh, the clash in L.A. or in a stadium, whether that's in L.A. or not, um, will stick around. The leak is sealed. So, after 10,000 plus people at the time of recording saw uh, Alexander Rossi's 2022 Napa Auto Nation livery um, on my video, and I'm sure several uh, hundreds, if not thousand uh, more, uh, R Factor 2 players uh, saw it um, in the recently released IndyCar DLC pack for R Factor 2. Um, Alexander Rossi's uh, 2022 livery has been removed uh, from that game. Oopsie doodle, uh, somebody uh, somebody leaked something a little early there, um, but uh, you know, 
It's uh, this these sort of things happen, and I'm sure we'll have an official reveal of uh, of now what is now the uh, the perhaps worst kept secret in the IndyCar livery game very soon. But while you probably clicked on this video, and you've probably already commented a hate comment about him, the most successful driver and successful winner in the NASCAR Xfinity Series history, history, will, com will not compete in 2022. It may be the end of King Kyle Busch in the NASCAR Xfinity Series, which he announced and confirmed today. And that being said, he will continue his seal clubbing. It will just happen in the NASCAR Truck Series. His first event is scheduled at his home track of Las Vegas Motor Speedway. In 362 starts, Kyle Busch scored 102 wins, 70 poles, and the 2009 Series Championship. Bush had only one DNQ in his Xfinity Series career and led over 20,000 total laps. However, Bush only competed in the full season twice. Of course, one of those was a championship winning effort. Many times running as many as 26 to 34 races a year while he was full time in the NASCAR Cup Series. He and other drivers like Carl Edwards and Brad Keselowski created a very heated debate about Cup Series racing in what many consider to be a lower series. And that is why, I, or this is the big topic of this video, or at least what I'm going to really expand upon, is the Cup Leeches and the effect that they had um, on the Xfinity Series and also the Cup Series. Because... It's, it's kind of a recent phenomenon, and by recent when, you know, I've got cars that are, you know, 20 years old and, and, and you know, some that are older on my desk. Um, I, I look at recent, and when I talk about racing, as kind of like the last 20 years. So the NASCAR Xfinity Series was once the NASCAR Bush Series. Bush Grand National is how um, a lot of people, and myself included, um, remember it. And it wasn't necessarily... A development series for drivers. Um, it really was just another national touring series that happened to have national television. A lot of times they were, their schedule would sometimes cross over with the Cup Series, but it wasn't by any stretch of the imagination all of the time. It really was a separate series under the NASCAR banner, and you had full-time Bush Series competitors. And there was nothing you know, no one was necessarily batting an eye when, say, Ken Schrader or Dale Earnhardt or later on Mark Martin came down into the series and ran it. It was just, okay, well, cool. We get an extra driver, uh, a big-name driver to come in and sell tickets. Well, as NASCAR began to grow, um, more and more the Xfinity Series was looked on as like AAA baseball, where drivers, if they didn't cut it in the Cup Series, would get pushed down a peg, and drivers who were, you know, under development contracts with, say, Hendrick or Everham or Penske or whatever would start either in ARCA or they'd move up to the Truck Series or they'd go to the Bush Series. Well, as that continued, there started to be a bit of a shift. Number one, because NASCAR was growing so much, you had tremendous amounts of sponsorship dollars. And there was so much sponsorship money in the Cup Series that a lot of sponsors trickled down to the Xfinity Series because there was just nowhere for them to go in the Cup Series. So that's when you get more, you get Cup Series level sponsors in the Xfinity Series. You started getting uh, Xfinity sponsors demanding Cup Series drivers drive their cars, especially at the big races. Daytona was always, or not always, but. You, you notice this, as, as the TV money and all the money in NASCAR was going up, the more and more Cup Series drivers uh, would bushwhack. This really came to a head when all of a sudden it seemed like NASCAR's development drivers were getting totally squeezed out for the Cup Series drivers. And even when a, a nationwide team or a Bush Series team, depending on the era or depending on the year, um, would actually develop a driver. Oftentimes, it was someone from Open Wheel. It would be like Jacques Villeneuve, or Juan Pablo Montoya, or Sam Hornish, or Danica Patrick. You know, it wouldn't be um, a true stock car personality. 
this all kind of came to a head in 2010 when I think there was like two rookies and a guy named Kevin Conway won the Rookie of the Year title. Um, and in a lot of ways, I think, you know, the transition A to make the Bush series a developmental series and B, um, all the, the Bushwhackers coming in like Kyle Bush, um, I think kind of hurt the next generation of NASCAR star because there's a bit of a generational gap between, say, Kurt Busch, whose rookie year was 2001, he's now the oldest driver in the series, and, say, a Kyle Larson or a Ryan Blaney, in my opinion. I think they missed some drivers in between there who are either in World of Outlaws now, maybe they're in IndyCar, they're not in the NASCAR Cup Series right now. So, yes, I, I think a long way around is, uh, to my point, is that, you know, I think Kyle Busch is more than, you know, I don't have a huge, huge problem with Kyle Busch and what he did in the Xfinity series because ultimately I'm an older school fan. I grew up in an era where it wasn't uncommon uh, to have a Cup Series driver come down and, and bushwhack. However, I think because of what NASCAR started to turn the series into and what purpose it began to serve despite not serving it uh, because of all these cup drivers in Xfinity um, I think it actually hurt the sport quite a bit in the driver department and in the marketability department of those drivers because you never got to see them develop their personalities because you were continuing to see Carl Edwards and Brad Keselowski every week winning races and competing for the championships and Kyle Busch um, rather than the Xfinity series drivers um, and the Xfinity Series drivers of that era that finally got to the Cup Series are all second-generation guys. It's like Chase Elliott. It's like Ryan Blaney. It's the Dillon brothers. There, were, there wasn't a lot of talent grown. Now you're starting to see it. You're starting to see names that aren't necessarily um, generational guys coming up. And that's probably good for NASCAR. Um, but in a lot of ways, it's, in my opinion, a direct result of the fact that NASCAR started limiting the Cup Series drivers running in Xfinity, and all of a sudden, the Xfinity drivers started gaining names. Ma names actually were starting to be made there. So thank you guys so much for watching. This has been David Land on YouTube. Subscribe for more motorsport content. It's going to be quite a stock car. Well, no, it's not. There's going to be some open wheel stuff, don't you worry, but... Obviously, with the Daytona 500 coming up, there's going to be a lot of stock car content. Be sure to subscribe. We'll see you in the next video.